next speaker for the commercial break is a man who knows what international relations and international politics mean. Sir Vaas, I heard Minister Verhagen has a busy schedule these days, right? Uh, yes, Vaas. Uh, since 2007, he's the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of the Netherlands, and uh, at the moment he's also the leader of his Christian Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Verhagen is a big fan of uh, Twitter, but uh, we are very pleased that he will give his speech today in real life. So uh, please give him a round of applause, uh, His Excellency Minister Maxime Verhagen. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mr. Mayor, Mr. Van Aertsen, dear delegates. Good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And although it's a royal building, it almost feels as if I am in New York, addressing the United Nations General Assembly. Representatives from more than 60 countries have traveled to The Hague to attend this European and National Model United Nations. I think this is an impressive number, and there is a good regional spread as well, and I'm sure that this will make for interesting times and a great atmosphere. One of the most inspiring aspects of being at the United Nations, whether it's in New York, Geneva, or here in The Hague, which happens to be indeed one of the biggest UN cities of the world, is that a whole wide world is represented on a few square miles. And this allows for an easy interaction with people from all corners of the globe. And that's a truly enriching experience that adds to one's sense of idealism. And I hope that you will have a similar experience in the days ahead. And that you will find also that cooperation between nations is the only way in which the challenges of the 21st century can be met even though achieving such cooperation can be a challenge in itself, even frustrating at times. Something you will no doubt also experience. And yet, there is no other way. The need for international cooperation has never been greater. The issues facing us are serious. Climate change, international terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear technology and nuclear material, pandemics, financial and economic crisis. And these challenges have one thing in common. They all transcend national boundaries. They are all offshoots of the same process of globalization. No country in the world is immune and no country in the world can solve these problems single-handedly. So we all need each other to come up with workable solutions. And that's precisely why you are here. Globalization demands international cooperation and collective action. And it's a process that we will have to manage together with a view to maximizing the benefits to the global community and minimizing the drawbacks. And to make the world a safer and more equitable place, we need an international order. And that multilateral system, based on legal principles that apply to all people and all nations, is designed to impose order and to prevent or resolve conflicts and chaos. It's in our interest that the leading players on the world stage commit themselves to that system and its rules. A world where everyone acted like a responsible stakeholder and worked within international frameworks would be a better place for all. Accordingly, Dutch foreign policy aims to bind as many countries as possible to the international structures based on rules and universal values. So, dear delegates, as you are about to experience, international cooperation does not come about by itself. It's difficult 
to get countries to work together in the common interest. This has always been the case in the past, and it remains so today. In fact, it even may be even more difficult in today's fast-changing world. Balance of power is shifting in a markedly eastern direction. Not long from now, three of the five largest economies in the world will be in Asia. China, India and Japan. And we are not just talking about economic power blocks. The new powers also demanding a greater political and military role. And this has consequences for this part of the world too. If the global seating plan is rearranged, the West will necessarily shift towards the edge. We can't all sit in the middle. And such a rise and fall of powers is also causing a change in the prevailing worldview. In such circumstances, the scope for successful international cooperation seems limited because of diverging national interests and differing views on universal values. Flawed institutions also stand in the way of successful international cooperation. And we need to ask ourselves whether the mechanisms designed to give shape to international cooperation are still 21st century proof. If the United Nations is the mechanism, we should ask ourselves if the United Nations is still up to the task in this day and this age. New players are demanding a bigger role on the world stage, and understandably so. The composition of the most important bodies that pronounces on matters of peace and security, the UN Security Council, is still based on the balance of power that existed in the aftermath of the Second World War. But the world has moved on. Even less appropriate is the idea that the president of the World Bank must be an American, and that of the IMF must be a European. Maybe that seemed a good idea in 1944 at Bretton Woods, but 65 years later, the fastest growing economies are in Asia, which is completely excluded from these functions. China, the second largest economy in the world, has 3% of the voting rights in the International Monetary Fund, and such arrangements are completely outdated. They undermine the legitimacy of our international order, which is widely seen as insufficiently representative. Consequently, countries turn their back on the international system because they can't identify with it. And this harms overall effectiveness and credibility. After all, the system is only as strong as the states that comprise it. So when states renounce the system and try to withdraw from the agreements they have made, the world becomes less safe and more unstable. Stability depends on order and rules. And because instability is not in anyone's interest, we must mend the flaws in the international structure. The structure itself must be, according to my view, be maintained. Imperfect though it is, it's the only platform we have. So we must cherish it because it has done us a great deal of good. We must cherish it because there is no acceptable alternative. But with the passage of time, the advent of the globalization and the tensions between countries, regions and religions, between north and south, and between rich and poor, made that multilateralism was more, is, is more relevant as ever before. Problems facing us today can only be solved with the participation of all stakeholders, that is, all the countries in the world. And this is why it's so important that every stakeholder remain committed to the system. Of course, giving the new powers a greater say in the world should also come 
at a price. They too should take their responsibility and contribute according to their related weight. And that holds true to the Security Council. Nations aspiring a seat in this body should also be willing to commit, for example, troops to international peacekeeping missions. And it holds also true for the IMF and the World Bank. A greater say in the decision-making process of the international financial institutions should also imply that countries are willing to play an active role, for example, when it comes to providing soft loans. To change a um, say in the world, if we look to the international financial institutions, according to my view, we should say no representation without taxation.